Emperor Palpatine's royal guards were amongst the most elite and intimidating forces within the Galactic Empire, embodying the pinnacle of loyalty and martial prowess. Their distinctive scarlet robes and helmets made them instantly recognizable symbols of the Emperor's power, designed to evoke both fear and awe. The design of their armor, while ceremonial in appearance, was rooted in a rich history of warrior cultures across the galaxy, drawing from the legacies of the Mandalorian Death Watch, the legendary Sun Gods, and the Old Galactic Republic Senate Guards. But beneath their ceremonial robes lay fully functional battle armor, offering superior protection without compromising agility or combat effectiveness. They weren't mere guards either, they were military leaders of the highest order. On occasion, the Royal Guards donned a distinct red variant of the Stormtrooper armor, leading the Empire into battle under the banner of the Emperor. The Royal Guards though were more than just an elite military unit. They were a fiercely loyal cadre, personally selected by Emperor Palpatine himself. Their training went far beyond physical conditioning and combat tactics. It was an indoctrination into absolute devotion. The guards were conditioned to obey Palpatine's commands without question, a loyalty so ingrained that they would turn against their own brethren if ordered. This unwavering allegiance was the cornerstone of their identity, making them not just soldiers but zealots, willing to sacrifice everything for their emperor. In this video, we explore the brutal selection process which molded the royal guards into one of the most deadly and devoted fighting forces in all of the empire. As seen in the Bad Batch, the transformation of the Galactic Republic into the Galactic Empire marked not only a political shift, but also a profound change in military philosophy and structure. In the early days of the Empire, the clones were slowly being replaced by regular soldiers, and the Royal Guards were the first to undergo this transition. Unlike the legions of the Stormtrooper Corps, which were primarily composed of clones at this time, the Royal Guards were handpicked by the Emperor himself from non-clone military units, symbolizing the start of this new era where clones were no longer needed. Recruitment for the Royal Guards was an exhaustive process, drawing candidates from the finest within the Imperial Academy system. The selection criteria were rigorous, focusing on physical prowess, intelligence, unwavering loyalty, and notably a latent sensitivity to the Force. These Force-sensitive guards underwent further testing and, if successful, received training from Dark Jedi to harness the Force, eventually joining the ranks of the Emperor's Shadow Guard, an elite Force-sensitive unit we'll be exploring in a future video. Training for the Royal Guard was conducted at the prestigious Imperial Royal Guard Academy on Yinchor. Yinchor had once been the home of the Yinchori, a race of aggressive aliens who wielded lightsaber-resistant swords and were immune to the Force. Although they were once allies of Palpatine, the Emperor turned on them, obliterating their planet. In an act of final domination over the Inchuri, he placed the Royal Guard Training Center on their planet. Here, recruits were subjected to a grueling regime that included mastery of the Echani unarmed combat art, honing their skills in the brutal confines of the Squall Arena. Their preferred weapon was the Force Pike. Originally used by Umbaran Shadow Assassins, the Force Pike in the hands of the Royal Guard became a tool of unmatched precision and deadly force, capable of delivering lethal wounds with astonishing speed. Despite its ceremonial appearance, the Force Pike was a versatile weapon, adept at crowd control, self-defense, and even torture. Some of the Royal Guards trained to such an extent that they could block blaster bolts with their pikes like a Jedi, despite having limited force sensitivity. But Royal Guardsmen's training extended far beyond the Force Pike, encompassing a wide array of weaponry and martial arts, from the double vibra blade to concealed heavy blaster pistols for ranged engagements. In certain cases, they wielded arc casters, or in the case of the Shadow Guard, even lightsaber pikes. Beyond this, their training extended to piloting specialized red variants of the TIE fighter, further enhancing their versatility as elite protectors. A unique aspect of their training involved a combat language, known only to the Royal Guard, ensuring secure and effective communication even in the heat of battle. Their preparations also included measures as meticulous as the removal of fingerprints, obliterating any trace of their former personal identity and cementing their total devotion to the Empire. 
One of the lesser known yet profoundly significant facets of their training was the instruction in techniques designed to sustain the Emperor's life in emergencies, although I could not find any recorded instances of this being put into practice. The path to becoming a royal guard was fraught with trials that tested both body and spirit, for to stand close to Emperor Palpatine was to be among the elite, a symbol of the Empire's indomitable will. As well as expert training in weapons and martial arts, the Emperor and Vader would personally test these trainees, not only in the art of fighting, but also in the realm of subservience and loyalty. One such visit by Palpatine and Vader was highlighted in the Crimson Empire comic book series. The day that Emperor Palpatine visited the training ground was one that would be etched in the memories of all present. His presence was a rare honour an event that underscored the gravity of their undertaking and the potential future that awaited them as protectors of the most powerful figure in the galaxy. When Palpatine's gaze fell upon a young trainee named Kerr Kanos, he inquired his name and began a penetrating stare. This stare, likely powered by the dark side, was an assessment of Kanos' potential to serve at the heart of the Empire. But this day would also mark a turning point for Kanos and his peers, a reminder of the lofty goal they aspired to achieve. The Emperor was here to remind them that the path to becoming a royal guard was steeped in sacrifice and dedication. Darth Vader was about to impart a harsh lesson on the nature of power and the vast gulf that lay between the aspirants and the Sith Lords of the Empire they sought to serve. As Vader stepped into the combat training platform, the atmosphere was charged with a palpable tension. A young trainee guard named Danid was brought forward. He was singled out for his prowess among the trainees, being regarded as the best among them. He was beckoned to face Vader in a trial that would serve as a stark illumination of the realities of serving the Empire at its highest echelons. Confusion and uncertainty marked Danid's approach, a stark contrast to Vader's imposing certainty. The Sith Lord's directive was simple yet daunting. To attack without reservation. Danid, looking to Emperor Palpatine for some sign of leniency, or perhaps reprieve, found none. The Emperor's command was clear, fulfill your duty. What ensued was a display of Vader's overwhelming might against Danid's best efforts. Despite Danid's flawless technique and admirable skill, Vader's treatment of him, a display that bordered on toy, underscored the chasm of power between the Sith Lord and the trainees. The culmination of their encounter saw Vader kick Danid to the floor before slicing off his hands just as he had done to Dooku many years earlier. But Danid's confrontation with Vader on the combat training platform was not yet over. Palpatine and Darth Vader still had another lesson to impart on the trainees who were eagerly watching. Vader's next actions underscored the brutal reality of their training and the expectations placed upon them. To Danid's credit, he did not beg for mercy and of course, none was offered. With a flick of his boot, Vader kicked Danid, the supposed best trainee royal guard, down the pit to his doom. Turning to the remaining trainees, Vader's critique was as harsh as the lesson itself. By indicating that even their best among them was far from ready, Vader challenged the trainees to push beyond their limits, to strive for a level of excellence that few could achieve. This moment was not just about the physical defeat of one individual, but a pivotal lesson in the realities of power, discipline, and the relentless pursuit of perfection required by the Empire. For Kirk Kanos and his fellow aspirants, this demonstration was a defining moment. It was a vivid reminder of the path they had chosen, one fraught with peril, demanding not only physical prowess, but an indomitable will to persevere against seemingly insurmountable challenges. Indeed, after Palpatine and Vader left, the trials and tribulations of the guards were far from over. After this, the guards were told to pair up with a fellow trainee. Over the course of a year, they would train ferociously together, becoming bonded as though they were brothers, learning to rely on one another and working together. Failure in training often meant death, with the Empire throwing ever harder and more brutal tasks at these young recruits. Of the 50 trainees that began training, only two pairs would remain by the end. These trainees would then be put in front of Palpatine and Vader for one final test. This test was not only one of skill with a blade, but also of loyalty and obedience. 
Palpatine would command the pair of trainees, now bonded as though they were brothers, to fight to the death. In the Crimson Empire comic series, we see the aforementioned Kirkanos reluctantly fight his training partner after being forcibly convinced by Lord Vader. The primal instincts of the prospective guards took over, leading to a rapid duel. Kirkanos was ultimately victorious, with the Emperor declaring he had passed his final test. However, this wasn't really so. Vader still had one final lesson in store for the trainee royal guard. When Kanos stated to his dead sparring partner that he was sorry, Vader chimed in. You no longer have the right to be sorry. From this moment on, you belong to the Emperor. His every whim, your command. It is not for you to question or regret the results of those commands. You have grown strong, Kokanos. You will indeed serve the Emperor well. He then told the young royal guard to defend himself, whilst igniting his crimson blade. As the royal guard charged at Vader, the Dark Lord expertly sliced off his mask, causing him to fall to the floor. Vader then departed with one final lesson. You have years ahead of you in service of the Emperor. Always remember you are weak before the power of the dark side. So, as we've explored in this video, the training of the Emperor's royal guard was one of the most ruthless and perhaps wasteful training processes in galactic history. But were the Royal Guards really that effective compared to other elite guard units such as the Jedi Temple Guard, the dreaded Imperial Sentinels, or Grievous' Magna Guards? Be sure to subscribe for an upcoming video determining the most effective elite guard unit in Star Wars. Or if you're watching in the future, check out this video here.